Good evening, everybody. I welcome you all and our esteemed speakers in today's webinar, Rewilding India, Role of the Private Sector in Biodiversity Conservation. The moderator for today's program is Dr. Ravina Agrawal, the director for Columbia Global Centers at Mumbai. Now I hand over today's program for further proceedings to Dr. Agrawal. Thank you, Aditya. And on behalf of Columbia Global Centers Mumbai, one of nine global centers of Columbia University and the Confederation of Indian Industries Western Region, I welcome you all to this very exciting panel on rewilding India. We all know that the planet's systems are in decline. The earth is warming at unprecedented rates. Our aquifers are drying up. The world's biodiversity is being lost at an alarming pace. The various ecosystem service benefits that we get from nature are estimated to have, if you are priceless, but if you must put a value to them, they're estimated to have almost um, more than $145 trillion in value. But as we lose forests, wetlands, and many other ecosystem features, we are fast eroding this natural capital. In the case of India, it has been estimated, this, uh, this loss has been estimated to be close to 5.7% of our annual GDP. So this Earth Day week, the, the, our, our Earth Day's um, focus this year is the theme is restore. And this is a very poignant um, idea and a very poignant theme. Can we take lands that are overbuilt, trashed, polluted, arid, and restore them so that humans and other species inhabiting these spaces can thrive? Can we intervene in lands that are almost on the verge of losing biodiversity and hit pause and formulate plans to move in the direction of biodiversity conservation? Must economic growth and development always come at the expense of the environment? We look forward to hearing from representatives of a key and resourceful stakeholder, the private business sector, on what can be done to conserve, restore, regenerate, um, and thrive as, um, you know, and, and for our planet to thrive um, in, in, an eco, in, an, in a biodiverse and an ecologically uh, strong way. So I call upon um, our first, uh, to deliver the keynote address for today, I call upon Mr. R. Mukandan, who's the Managing Director and CEO of Tata Chemicals Limited. He's an engineer from IIT Roorkee and also an alumnus of the Harvard Business School. During his 26 year old career with uh, the Tata Group, he's held various responsibilities across the chemical, automotive and hospitality sectors of the group. Mr. Mukandan serves on executive committees of various industry, um, industrial fora, um, such as the Confederation of Indian Industries, the Bombay Chamber of Commerce and Industry, em Employers Federation of India, and, and the All India Management Association. So um, please join us and over to you, Mr. Mukandan. Uh, thank you. And let me first say good evening to everyone. And uh, I thank you all for joining this uh, session today and uh, well, firstly hope everybody is safe and your families are safe and healthy and we are very much happy to collaborate with the uh, columbia global center once again and in this regard i want to thank ravina for having invited us and made us part of a journey which we all have to walk together uh, let me just start by uh, you're going to hear a lot more from the fellow panelists who are experts in this field uh, but I'm going to give some broad uh, ideas of what we've been doing in this country and what we can do more and what uh, we have been doing within our own company so that it sort of sets the frame of what we ought to be looking at when we uh, move forward in this direction. Uh, so broadly, I think if you, if you look at it, uh, biodiversity, circular economy, and climate change are broadly, in my view, the three pillars around which one has to build business sustainability. Uh, these are not a question of... Uh, whether we move in this direction, it is fundamentally how fast we move in that direction. I think the point about net zero or net positive in water, these are all things which are going to come to the industry in any case. And I think it's better that we are ahead of the curve than behind the curve. And uh, there is no journey. This is not a journey of developed countries versus developing. This is a journey every country needs to move. 
in our view. And the fundamental reason is that, especially India is very much stressed in many, many of the resources which are so essential. And uh, we are dependent on the planet, uh, plant, animal resources, ecosystem services for our production process. And for us, we need to maintain healthy ecosystem, whether it be air, soil, water quality, to make sure that our economic system works well. So fundamentally, I think business is one of the leading stakeholders in making sure that we can conserve biodiversity. We can, in a sense, halt the negatives and reverse the nature loss. And uh, this, in our view, fundamentally within CII, we hold a view that it helps us to manage risks in business operation from negative impacts and would actually further the business interests in the long run. And uh, it makes sense in terms of long-term business sustainability. Uh, fundamentally, we think there is, a, there is a lot to learn from each company, each enterprise, each, uh, each kind of value uh, uh, experiment which we, we are doing individually and scale those which are working so that we can all move on this journey together. Uh, one of the first things which I would say business needs to do is to communicate because many are convinced, but there are also many who are still very tentative about it. And communicating to key stakeholders, whether it be shareholders, investors, partners, more importantly, the consumers, they will be the axis of change going forward on positive impact of biodiversity, uh, I think would be very critical. Uh, in any, any, in any big shift, I think uh, policies make a big, big impact. Regulatory framework makes a big impact. So I think working with government also makes sense, especially in terms of promoting incentives, not just negatives in terms of regulations to stop something, but also to promote the right thing in terms of positive labeling. What we've done within CII is to start an uh, initiative, which is called India Business Biodiversity Initiative. I was the first chair of that initiative, and that initiative was carried on uh, initially. And it was fundamentally started with, in partnership with the uh, Ministry of Environment, uh, Forest, and Climate Change in 2014. 16 companies came together, and we signed up to uh, travel the journey together. We have got about 40 business signatories now, 13 stakeholders. And broadly, I think we have got about 4.5. We add the revenue of uh, these companies. It's about 4.5% of India's GDP as of 2019. So it's beginning to make, make the change. And they come from diverse sectors, which have, whether it be power, whether it be steel, whether it be cement, all, all the sectors you would immediately think of when you want to conserve uh, biodiversity, the resource, uh, the sectors which actually depend on the natural resource. Uh, in IBBI, we have learned that uh, th there are various mechanisms which industry can adopt. We can integrate these aspects into our supply chain, both in our operations as well as in our partners, and we can become biodiversity champions. So the key achievements I want to say, I think there's a long way to go, but uh, certainly uh, we have made specific commitment. Uh, at least 20 of the business uh, 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 signatories have made commitment to have no net loss of biodiversity by 2030. And that's a significant one in the sense that uh, it also includes people in pulp and paper co in companies. So those who depend on forest resources and they made this commitment, uh, 20 of basically 50% of the uh, signatories have already made that commitment. Uh, our first starting point in this was uh, to have a voluntary reporting on a 10 point declaration. And uh, uh, I'm glad to say not only are we reporting, 20% of the members have already in, have, have started to report integrated biodiversity as part of their non-financial reporting in their annual reports. Uh, we've also screened 300 sites uh, for biodiversity and are implementing action plan for change. 32% of the companies have actually undertaken valuation studies on the basis of which they are actually taking business decision. And I can confirm that working for biodiversity actually has had a positive impact on all the companies. And it's fundamentally our commitment as part of CII to move on this journey forward by bringing together like-minded companies, but also making sure what we are doing actually attracts others to join in. And uh, we've had series of uh, consultations on post-2020 uh, global uh, biodiversity framework. And uh, we've actually given feedback on the same, about 300 participants, including those from national and global businesses attended these consultations. And inputs from these consultations are uh, to adapt science-based targets to reduce carbon footprint, uh, footprint on the nature by uh, 
half by 2030, avoid operations in areas of high conservation value by 2022, and transitioning to no net loss, net positive approach for existing operation. Also to support local bodies and community groups for conservation and restoration of biodiversity. So this is what we've done this year, even though we've been having this uh, serious uh, uh, disruption in our consultations. We've been doing this through uh, digital media and making sure that we can progress all these commitments, which is fundamentally to say that we will uh, go towards no net loss and net positive approach for existing operation by 2030. Within Tata Chemicals, I can give you a few examples of what we've done. I think my colleague, ex-colleague Rishi Patania is here, who's actually done part of this work as when he was part of our team. Uh, we, we've actually looked at marine ecology. Not many people speak about marine ecology as one of the key biodiversity hotspots. And uh, we've, uh, we've actually uh, uh, done coral transplantation from Andamans to the coasts of Gujarat, which has been, which failed in the first attempt. But I think second attempt, uh, the, these corals are now uh, growing in a, in a rich way. It is, it's, it's been a, a huge amount of learning in how do you transplant and how do you sort of uh, make sure your coral reefs are in a good, healthy condition. The other flagship program we've been running is species protection as part of biodiversity. I think the species protection idea is very important because when, when we protect tiger, we are not just protecting tiger, we are protecting the entire ecosystem of the tiger. And taking the same example, we picked up in the marine ecosystem, the whale shark, and we have been uh, spearheading the whale shark program for many years now. It is It has been seen as the by UN recognized as one of the major conservation programs. And uh, government of Gujarat has been a partner in this, especially because uh, these uh, whale shark, pregnant whale shark would come to coast of India to give birth to young ones and they would get caught in the fishing nets and they would be killed. Uh, but I think uh, what we've done is work with the fishermen to say that they, they need to sort of release these uh, uh, pregnant whales so that the next generation could survive. And uh, what the government of Gujarat and uh, Ministry of Environment and Forest have done is for every documentary evidence the fisherman had to cut his net, they are compensating the fishermen also for the cost of the new net as well as compensating the fishermen for loss of livelihood. This has been a big, big shift because they, now they know that uh, if they, they release the whale shark back in the uh, sea, uh, their, 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 their income and they don't have a capital loss. I think that, that has worked out very well. So there are programs like this which we can work, but I think one learning we have in this is uh, working with people who understand biodiversity, but also working with communities is a big, big element of protecting biodiversity. This is not uh, uh, sit, sitting and uh, uh, preaching from a pulpit of what is the right thing to do, but actually engaging with community and making them move in the right direction. But before we engage with community, I think we must set our house in order. Industry must be the one which is uh, uh, making its operations are all clear and we are not having a major negative impact on biodiversity. And I think that's a journey, getting your house in order and then working with communities and over a period of time, building a very vibrant biodiversity, uh, which India needs, which the world needs. And uh, uh, one thing I must say, I always admire about our, our country is that despite such dense population, despite uh, such huge pressure on land and all resources, uh, India is rich in biodiversity and it is on us, it is upon us the responsibility to protect what we have inherited and enhance what we have for the future generations. With this, I want to compliment uh, the, all of you for being part of this journey and uh, coming together in, in, a, in a forum where like-minded uh, people like us can think, think about future actually goes a long way into furthering the cause of the biodiversity, which is one of the key pillars of sustainability in my view. And thank you all for inviting me and uh, giving me an opportunity to be part of this journey. Thank you. Thank you so much for that very inspiring and you know thoughtful um, address, really. Uh, getting the house in order, um, you know, and, and and speaking for how do, how does one do that? I think we're going to hear uh, fantastic examples uh, from the different uh, participants today. But before we move into, um, um, you know, turning over the floor to the various industry representatives, I'm very delighted to invite um, Professor Ruth DeFries, who's a university professor of earth and environmental sciences at Columbia University to join us. Uh, Professor DeFries is chair of the faculty advisory committee of the Columbia Global Centers Mumbai, and she's also the <clears throat> 
She's also just been announced as the co-dean of the uh, co-founding dean of uh, Columbia University's Climate School. Of course, Columbia University has a long-standing history and flagship institutions such as the Earth Institute, which are committed to um, in, uh, committed to the environment. Professor DeFries's own research, um, you know, uses uh, satellites and field surveys to examine how the world's demands for food and other resources are changing land use throughout, throughout the tropics and also in India. Um, she has many accolades and many publications. She's elected as a member of the US National Academy of Sciences and, a, and is a recipient of the MacArthur Genius Award. And she has a, over a hundred scientific papers uh, to her name and is committed to linking science with policy for example, through her involvement with the Environmental Defense Fund, um, Science for Nature and People World Wildlife Fund. And she's also committed to reconciling conservation and development in Central India. So um, over to you, Ruth. Thank you so much, Ravina. And thank you for, for organizing this session and for the opportunity to be part of it. Uh, I hope everyone is safe and well in this very, um, frightening situation with COVID. And also to thank Mr. Mukundan for those wonderful remarks and reminding us that we are all in this journey uh, together. And it is quite a, quite a journey that we are on. I'd like to take a few moments to reflect on India's incredible uh, natural diversity and how critical the uh, having healthy ecosystems is to the well being of everyone in the country, everyone in the world, and what an important role the private sector has to play. So, this picture here is from uh, Valparai, Tamil Nadu, in the Western Ghats, which was, uh, I was fortunate to visit uh, as one of my last places that I was able to go before uh, the world changed for all of us with the pandemic. And this is, as I'm sure you all know, a, a stunning landscape. And, uh, and there are many tea and coffee plantations. So it is quite a modified landscape. But in this landscape, there are fragments of forests that have been left. And what I was visiting there was the work of one of my students uh, who is studying this wonderful work that is being done by the Nature Conservation Foundation on these small fragments which are left within the large ocean of the tea and coffee plantations to restore these fragments. And this is on private land. And the, the result is, is uh, quite impressive that, uh, that through uh, quite a bit of time and effort to restore these fragments to their uh, with the with lots of diversity of trees and to be able to have the uh, the diversity of birds and insects and and uh, and these small fragments being such an important element in the landscape to be able to uh, act as stepping stones and keep some keep the diversity in the landscape. So there are many examples of these fragments and you can see how this looks from before the restoration to after the restoration. And it takes quite an effort, uh, but it is possible to have this maintain some diversity in these modified landscapes. Now we all know that the Western Ghats is a world renowned biodiversity hotspot, uh, but throughout India, the biodiversity as Mr. Mukandan said is just uh, just incredible. India is one of the 17 mega diversity countries with multiple biodiversity hotspots and, uh, and the diversity is just so incredible and so much a part of uh, the culture of India. The, the natural biological heritage is just so rich uh, throughout the whole country. And despite, despite the intense human pressures and demands for resources, uh, India has been able to maintain this biodiversity and it is quite, uh, quite an achievement. So throughout the country, there are uh, 
uh, protected areas of various sorts, tiger reserves, um, na national parks, uh, wildlife sanctuaries, and so on. And they cover about 5% uh, of, uh, of the land surface. And they really are the cornerstone to maintaining uh, diversity, but they are not enough. <laughs> in India or in the uh, entire world, the same is true. The protected areas are not enough to secure biodiversity. And particularly in India, where the biodiversity is so rich and the protected areas are so small, <clears throat> and many of the species, such as tigers and large ranging mammals, need to move over large spaces. So the, one of the major issues is the rapid expansion of infrastructure in the, in the country, the roads, the um, rail and so on, which is so critical to development and how to reconcile the need for this infrastructure with, with the need for keeping connectivity across the landscape. And I'm showing you here a picture uh, where I work a lot in Madhya Pradesh, where there is uh, where there is now an example through the work, uh, hard work of many people, to have a uh, um, a uh, uh, wadla corridor. Here you see the sign for the Tiger Crossing, and a uh, and an underpass that is very long. I think one of the longest in the world. To to be able to maintain the connectivity of the landscape while achieving the important development goal of the uh, of infrastructure expansion. And as Mr. McCundin said so beautifully, that is really where we need to go to be able to find ways to, uh, to maintain and enhance the incredible biodiversity, but also to achieve the uh, development needs at individual levels and at a country level. So there is now quite a focus, as I'm sure you all aware, on, uh, on clim meeting climate goals. And India has had for quite some time the goal of achieving 33% uh, forest cover or green cover uh, in the country. And <clears throat> there is the Green India Mission and the nationally determined contributions to sequester carbon through reforestation. And that is another opportunity to bring the climate goal together and bring the biodiversity goal together. But it doesn't happen on its own, because if we just want to sequester carbon, then, uh, then a way to do that would be to plant trees, uh, monoculture, uh, uh, tree plantations, <clears throat> and that would certainly sequester carbon, but would fall short of achieving biodiversity goals. So I promise I'm only going to show you one scientific graph here, and this is work from one of my postdocs, Anand Suri, uh, where he looked at the, uh, the carbon that can be sequestered in diverse tree plantations versus monoculture tree plantations. Uh, and the stability if, if, uh, with variability in climate to be able to maintain that carbon. And what this plot on the right is showing us is that the plantation, the blue, the teak and eucalyptus plantation, uh, have less carbon density and are more subject to um, pest damage and, and uh, damage from climate events than the diverse plantations uh, that are in the green cones here, the evergreen and deciduous plantations. So having the climate goals and the biodiversity goals mesh through, um, through creating diverse restoration opportunities is really, um, really an opportunity with so much attention now on the, uh, on the climate goals. So another, in such an important aspect, as Mr. McClendon said, is about the water. So here is the, uh, the, I'm showing you the water tower that is central India, where five important rivers have their headwaters in this region. And this is one of the important water towers for the country that, that supplies water to so many downstream um, agricultural areas and cities and, and downstream user, um, users. 
So the water towers are throughout the country, Western Ghats, the Himalayas, of course. Uh, and the, um, the goal to, uh, to maintain the water supply, which is so critical, depends on having healthy forests in these, uh, in these water towers, in these uh, watersheds for these important rivers. And the picture here is some, uh, some degraded forest in this region of central India. And you can imagine if these were uh, more um, uh, healthier forests that had less, uh, less demands on them, uh, that there is more water that would infiltrate through the soil and, and act as a sponge that stores soil at water and releases water and, uh, and achieves the function that like dams and reservoirs that, that require so many resources achieves the function of, uh, of being able to contribute to a, uh, a water supply for all of those many millions of downstream users. So biodiversity goes together with so many of the other important goals and demands that we have on our ecosystem. So I don't wanna leave out the important point of agrodiversity, and this is particularly an area where uh, the private sector has such a large role because uh, the private sector so much um, has an influence on what consumers consume and what farmers grow. So, um, you know, the, the diversity of crop varieties is just so incredible uh, in, in the country. There are thousands of varieties of of rice and uh, so many varieties of other cereals. And uh, India, of course, is so famous for its diversity of, uh, of brinjal. And, uh, and be, keeping that diversity is important for so many reasons, for the nutrition that people get and for uh, climate resilience in, in the face of the uh, future uh, climate variability that we know we all face, that, the, uh, that these local varieties have the secrets, genetic secrets, to be able to, uh, to withstand climate extremes. So it's, it's a matter of maintaining the seeds and maintaining the, uh, the uh, ability to grow these crops, but also the knowledge, the knowledge of uh, so many farmers who know how to grow these crops, know how to keep the seeds and know how to, um, how to keep these varieties alive. So here's a picture on the right of a farmer from um, central India at, standing in her farm. And, uh, and it doesn't look like much, but if you look up close, you will see, and she can explain to you, the incredible um, diversity that is being maintained in that single very small uh, uh, plot that she is farming. So in there is a variety of fodder crops and, and uh, other types of um, uh, crops and local varieties. And keeping that knowledge alive is as important as keeping the seeds and the, uh, and the varieties. And I know we are all well aware of, of the uh, revival of the uh, traditional cereals, which is, uh, is uh, very, in my opinion, a very good trend to see because these are not only climate resilient, uh, adapted to uh, growing conditions in places like Central India and, and uh, um, um, the Western part of the country and so on, uh, but they're also highly nutritious and, uh, and having the ability to, uh, to continue with this revival and expand this revival of traditional cereals depends on maintaining the, uh, the agrodiversity, the diversity of crops and the knowledge to be able to, uh, to grow them. So to, uh, to sum up here, and it's so exciting to be part of this session, uh, because the private sector has played such a large role in this conversation. And there are just so many reasons, as Mr. Mukundan said, uh, to nourish India's incredible diversity. Uh, maybe the most important is the cultural, spiritual, amazing uh, biological heritage. 
uh, but also for the pragmatic reasons of water, of climate, of nutrition. And, you know, I've been working in, in India for, for a long time and it never ceases to amaze me how much diversity there is, how much cultural appreciation of the diversity there is, and in spite of the intense human pressures, how that diversity uh, persists. And I look forward to, uh, to continuing this discussion about the role of the private sector. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor DeFries. Uh, it's um, you know, very nice to get that overview and the reminder as to how crucial and critical um, biodiversity is in various you know, elements, um, whether it's crops or whether it's uh, you know, fauna and um, the challenges that we face in terms of infrastructure growth or in, um, you know, and, 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 but the moral commitment as well as the pra pragmatic commitment that we need to have to conserve it. So thank you so much for, those, for that overview. It's, uh, I'm gonna invite um, our speakers and I think um, it might make sense for me to invite you one by one and have uh, hear from you about your um, about the the examples that you are um, pre presenting of your company's um, you know intervention in this space. So my first uh, so the, our first guest um, who's going to present is uh, Hish, uh, Hishmi Hussain, who's the head of biodiversity and corporate sustainability at Tata Steel, and he's also a commission member of the International Union for Conservation of uh, Nature, elected fellow of the Linnaean, Linnaean Society of London, and a life member of the Club of Rome. So I'm not going to get into um, you know the, the, what the work that you do at Tata Steel, I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to hear from you. Um, so look forward to your presentation and welcome. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, first of all, it is indeed a pleasure to uh, talk about uh, the work which we are doing at Tata Steel. And this work is something which is aligned with the Achi target as well as the national biodiversity target. And it is also helping in achieving the Sustainable Development Goal 15, Life on Land. So when we are talking about the restoring mined out area for the biodiversity conservation, it is very important all of us to understand that there is an integration of biodiversity conservation, business need, as well as in which uh, landscape we are working. Uh, we got the legacy to give back to the society. With that uh, philosophy, we have started most of our work, but now business is very important and the business model is always helping. So just uh, the previous speaker talked about the ecosystem services and how the biodiversity is helping and how the IBBI initiative and Tata Steel is one of the founding member of it. And we, we contributed for this initiative because we feel that uh, there is a lot of opportunity what the good work we have done, we must tell to the industry, then we get the support from different stakeholders. So the, uh, the first very important thing is that the ecosystem services, the water is important for running the business. And if we are impacting the biodiversity, definitely our business is going to be impacted. The second very important aspect is license to operate. In India, we are having a very strong system in place where we need to get the environment clearance, forest clearance. If we are not able to demonstrate, if we are not able to conserve the biodiversity, we will not allow to work in the landscape or in the estates. We are having our operation in two of the most uh, dense forests. It is Jharkhand and Odisha. So now you can understand it is very important for all the companies and the corporates who are working in the mining sector, especially, they must consider about biodiversity conservation. The third very important aspect is that the people are dependent on the nature resources. And when we are starting doing some mining, we definitely impacting their livelihood. Now, the social license to operate is something that, that we can get only if we are having a respect for nature conservation. And when we are engaging with these people for their programs. The fourth more important thing is that when we are approaching to the external finances, definitely the World Bank, ADB, 
all these organizations are asking that you must show that what is the biodiversity impact. Have you done the biodiversity impact assessment? Do you have biodiversity management plan? Until and unless you are not satisfied these conditions, you will not allow to do the operation or do the business in the area where these are rich biodiversity resources. These two pictures you can see, this is one of a mine which uh, we are doing in this area since 1920. A second picture you can see there is a, some of reclamation work has been done. So this year we are able to achieve about 100 hectare waste dump has been converted into the beautiful biodiversity park, which is having butterfly garden, which is having medicinal plant garden, and many of the activities which are helping in enhancing the biodiversity. Uh, the biodiversity journey of Tata Steel in terms of engagement with IUCN has started in 2013. We engaged with IUCN, try to understand, bring the experts on board uh, to know that uh, what better we can do for the society for biodiversity conservation. In 2016, we have launched the biodiversity policy with the objective to achieve the no net loss. Many times it happened that many companies are not confident that whether they are able to achieve the no net loss or what they need to do additional for it, but it can be achieved if we are having a systematic biodiversity management plan in place. In 2019, we have established the Center of Excellence uh, for Biodiversity Management that has given the opportunity to provide a good governance structure. So whatever the good work the sites are doing, that work need to be compiled and present before the board and get the support and guidance from the senior leadership. Uh, until 2021, we are able to achieve about 52% of our sites are covered under the biodiversity management plan. Uh, so, uh, Dump stabilization is something which is essentially required as one of the compliance condition. But if you are doing it beyond the compliance, that is helping in addressing the soil erosion and water retention. So you can see these three pictures that how this degraded waste dumps has been developed into a beautiful forest. And uh, that is again helping in conservation of the biodiversity. And this, uh, the, the vegetable grass we have used, we have used the local knowledge uh, for conservation of uh, the biodiversity. Yeah, so afforestation is another very important aspect of uh, uh, conservation when we are talking. Uh, so we have done about in this year, 4.9 lakh tree planted all across Tata Steel. In the first picture, you can see this was a waste uh, mine dump uh, in 152 hectare area. This dump has been converted into a very lavish forest. And now it is providing the house to the birds and it is the local community who was dependent, they are collecting the NTFP from it. So again, we have aligned that uh, conservation practice uh, with the SDG 15, that how if we are enhancing the forest cover, definitely it will help in increasing the biodiversity and livelihood to the local people. So all these initiatives, what I'm talking, uh, we have our BMP plans uh, for the sites and these BMP plans having this clear action and the milestones. So in 2011, we have started doing the Mewaki plantation, which is one of the buzzwords. Many of the people is doing, there are benefit of doing a Mewaki when we are having a scarcity of land, we can create a self-sustaining forest. So what we have done, we have, uh, we were doing, we were having a plantation program. We have put this plantation program with some of the scientific knowledge and try to achieve these Miyawaki plots. And all across Tata Steel, we have done this Miyawaki plantation and we are getting the sustainable uh, forests which are uh, creating all across Tata Steel mining location as well as other operation. So something as uh, uh, Professor Ruth was talking about the water and water is very important. And whenever we are talking about uh, biodiversity conservation, it is very important to integrate the water management integrate the biodiversity management and definitely the livelihood and the people as the important stakeholders for whom we are dependent significantly because uh, the, the, the vision of the Tata group is that uh, these communities are the purpose of our existence. They are not our stakeholders, but because of them, we are exist. So we have created uh, such kind of uh, rainwater harvesting water bodies all across Tata still we are able to uh, collect about 1 billion liter of water all across. That is helping in reducing our 
uh, water, fresh water dependency on the, on the resources. Uh, so something which is uh, very important that once we are able to improve the forest diversity, definitely we also need to understand that it is bringing the bird biodiversity. So we have initiated a bird dish nesting program in one of uh, our mining locations. Uh, once the success of this program has been gone up, we have spread this program all across it. So it is helping in enriching the biodiversity around our mining location, as well as our, our, our habitation wherever we are working. So again, it is contributing towards the SDG, uh, the target 15.1. Uh, awareness is something that uh, if we are not able to increase the awareness, we will not be able to get the support from the stakeholders. For increasing the awareness about the medicinal plant, importance of the pollinators, importance of uh, uh, the nakshatra and all, because if we are able to connect the local people, then only the people will contribute towards conservation of uh, the biodiversity. If the employee are not connected uh, with the activities of the biodiversity, we will not get the support and the success of the event. So to, to get this, uh, we, we have created the medicinal plant garden. We have created nature garden. We have created the butterfly garden. We have explained that how important these butterfly for us for the food security. Similarly, people are able to connect their lives uh, with the medicines. So they are able to connect and they are able to contribute for, for the conservation. So community awareness and engaging with the kids is something that as a corporate, as a individual, it is essentially required. We have a very a big program around the green school program where our schools, which are located in the mining locations, these schools, uh, the kids are getting the awareness. We are having a Tata Zoo in which we are having a regular program for the kids. Uh, this year, unfortunately, because of COVID, we are not able to have the physical program, but uh, but we have done online programs and where we have, are able to engage with the schools, with the kids. And this awareness program, again, bringing the, the knowledge of the local people, just like we have, uh, we have organized uh, some of the program related to the local indigenous knowledge of the medicines uh, which the local people are having. We have created the Vulture Conservation Day. We have created World Biodiversity Day. All these events has bring uh, the knowledge and the awareness, and as a corporate, we are able to bring this uh, this to the people. Uh, so these are the seven initiatives, uh, which briefly I talk about how the corporate are contributing for the biodiversity conservation. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you so much. Um, our next speaker is uh, Rishi Patania, who's the head of corporate social responsibility for United Phosphorus Limited. Rishi has spent 23 years in the community development and conservation field, promoting CSR and sustainability programs, and received and he's received many CSR sustainability leadership awards. Over to you, Rishi. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Ravina. Uh, what I'll do is I'll try to build on what Mr. Mukundan said, uh, because primarily he was my mentor, and he really uh, gave me an understanding of nature conservation when I was in Tata Chemicals. See, there are uh, uh, two aspects. One is a, uh, a nature conservation and species conservation, or maybe holistic biodiversity from a business perspective. But there's also a small opportunity that we can do through CSR space. And uh, uh, the CSR space in India has gone a lot of changes in the last five, seven years. So I'll be talking about uh, the work that we are doing at UPL in the last five, six years as a small initiative from CSR space, what we have learned and what we have tried to do in the process. Uh, I'll just share a few programs and few slides and maybe I'll be open for discussion. Uh, that will be a better thing to do. Uh, at UPL, uh, our nature conservation initiative is called Vasudha, which in Sanskrit means mother or the giver of wealth. We are primarily uh, aiming to integrate nature conservation project by involving all stakeholders. That, that's what we are trying to do. And we have multiple uh, initiatives across different geographies. This is kind of a, uh, a snapshot of what we are doing uh, in different ge geographies. We are working on uh, a species conservation uh, project, uh, which is Saras. Saras is a native uh, crane from India. 
we are working on conservation of wildlife in Tsavo uh, National Park in in Kenya. Uh, a bit of an innovative project to minimize the man animal conflict uh, through sunflower farming. We are working on social forestry in barren lands, uh, but this is primarily with the community lands. We are not uh, talking about what we are doing in our backyard, but mostly what we are doing in the communities. So I'll be touching about these two projects and uh, then I'll be open for the discussion. On the same way, based on our learning in India, we took these projects to different parts of uh, uh, other geographies also, like we have started a social forestry project in Colombia, we have started in Mexico also. Uh, we are working on mangrove plantation in Gujarat coastlines. We are working on uh, community water conservation projects also. Uh, but fundamentally what we did was we started with uh, working with community as Mr. Mukundan said, in any conservation projects, the, 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 the base is how you really involve community in the process because they are the custodian and they are the owners of this initiative. So this is our one project which we started five years back. Uh, it's called UPL Saras Conservation Project. Uh, we, we have been working on this project for five years. In fact, this is a sixth year. Uh, we have been able to reach only 36 villages till now. Uh, we have reached approximately 17,000 students and maybe around 4,000 villagers. Uh, in the process, we have formed uh, so, uh, rural service production groups in these villages. This is a primary group of farmers, young farmers. Mm, the biggest achievement that we have achieved in the last five years is, uh, as against the sighting of 400 or something, when we started this project, in this four villages, we have cited 829 saras. That's an increase of 45.2 percentage. Uh, the project on species conservation really uh, needs kind of a consistent effort. It can't be a short-term project, maybe not even a three-year project. It really needs a commitment of long-term. Also, apart from community participation, which is the most essential for any conservation project, it also requires uh, a coordinated effort between different stakeholders. Like for this project, our partners are Gear Foundation as a knowledge partner, the forest department who are really partnered with us uh, for, for the rescue or maybe for treatment of the birds whenever we are sighted them. Uh, I would like to flag off one very uh, uh, a small issue here. Uh, when, when, when I look backward and when I see the, the, uh, the organization which are involved in species conservation or maybe at a, a broader level nature conservation, there are very few organizations. Uh, even though uh, there's a clear cut scope to do that in the CSR Act, but you will find very, very less organization. Also now, uh, uh, with the act uh, talking about uh, lo long-term project, which is defined as three year, I think uh, it really kind of limits the uh, effort of different organizations which are doing that. Uh, Mr. Mukundan was talking about uh, the wheelchair project. It it took it's one of the best conservation project globally, but it took an effort of twelve years by so many people. Then only this result was achieved. So essentially what I'm trying to say is a conservation project is something which really calls for a long-term commitment, long-term commitment uh, of effort, of resources, of everything. This is one project that we have started just two years back. We are still learning. We are trying to uh, understand uh, how, how, how we can uh, more work on this, again, in partnership with Forest Department uh, and Nature Conservation Group of Surat. Uh, we have done the first soft release. We have 28 spotted deer and 20 and 10 uh, other species in this park. But this is more of a pilot project that government of Gujarat is doing, and we are partnering with them and supporting them in this, this endeavor. Uh, this is a project that I would like to spend some time. We started four years back, and uh, the idea was uh, to identify uh, the the, the barren land that's there around us, uh, working with the community. We normally uh, go with a, a, a process where it's end-to-end -end project. So we, we start uh, with the, the fencing and then there's a water facility that's created. 
we do spend a lot of time identifying the local species, uh, partnering with community, partnering with local government officers to understand what are the local species that can be planted in this area. And uh, uh, then there's a complete community ownership that's built around this, this, this project because end of the day, they have to own and they have to manage because our project uh, exit plan is after five years. So after five years, we'll hand over this to the, to the community and to the panchayat and we'll, we'll move on. Uh, very happy to share with you when we started this project, our first project was a 54 acre plot in uh, Baruch district, a place called Mandwa. Uh, when we uh, last uh, did an informal uh, biodiversity mapping. Uh, we were able to cite and document 36 bird varieties there and so many other species also. So it's not only the, the, the forest cover that, that gets increased. In fact, it's the whole uh, biodiversity that, that changes for that particular area. And we are working on four more uh, projects of such kind with four different communities in different parts of the, the Gujarat. Uh, this is an innovative project that we started just two years back. Uh, the idea was to uh, minimize the man-animal conflict uh, through promotion of uh, sunflower farming. We are working with Mr. Patrick uh, Kilonzo. I'm sure a lot many of you must be knowing him. He's called Waterman of the Savo. Uh, uh, the, the idea is to conserve uh, uh, conserve the uh, the animals through through. Uh, smart farming in that area. So I'll take a, a pause here uh, because I've got so many initiatives, but I think uh, what I'm trying to say is uh, when we work uh, on biodiversity and, and, and nature conservation, I think it essentially calls for a long-term commitment. It can't be a one-year project or a three-year project. Second, it essentially calls for a community participation. Third is it essentially calls for a partnership with like-minded people. Um, knowledge partners, you have got uh, people who have experience of working in this field. I think then only we can expect some kind of an outcome uh, from this kind of initiative. I do see a lot of scope because with the CSR uh, space uh, evolving, I think there's a lot of scope. I'll, I'll just take a pause here. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, uh, for giving thank me you. this opportunity to share the work that we are doing. Thank you, so thank you Rishi. This is wonderful. Um, our next speaker is Tejashri Joshi, who is the Head of Environmental Sustainability at Godridge and Boyce Manufacturing Company Limited. Um, at Godridge, she's been taking care of multiple programs like environmental compliances, waste and water treatment and management initiatives and supporting green products and building certifications. So um, over to you, Tejashri. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm going to talk about a flagship program that is run by Godish and Boys on management of mangroves in Vikroli, which is a suburb of Mumbai. Uh, the challenges and uh, the initiatives that have been we have taken over many years now for protecting this very, very important ecosystem for an island city like Mumbai. So this picture is of the mangroves in the Mumbai. Uh, so it is very important that when we are talking about biodiversity, we actually first identify the type of uh, ecosystems and habitats that you have within the premises or within the area that you're talking about. And uh, before going on to the kind of species that we have, or we draw, like, draw in a ben, uh, baseline for uh, the biodiversity in the area. So uh, while we did this conservation, we also did the entire mapping of the township in Vikroli, which is Mumbai. And we identified that there are multi, uh, we have multiple occupants within the premise. We have the industry operating, we have our residential complexes, schools, hospitals, offices. But at the same time, there are different ecosystems which are coexisting in the same space. Like we have a natural wilderness in the terms of mangroves. And, and we also have modified habitats and man-made habitats within the urban settings of uh, the city, where uh, it is a highly uh, densified uh, constructed spaces. And uh, this comprises of different habitats like the mangrove forest, we have the natural wetlands, uh, we've created artificial ponds, grasslands, different scrubby areas, we have hilly, hilly areas, open spaces, playgrounds, uh, created roadside avenues, vertical gardens, man-made terrace gardens, and uh, uh, human interventions through plantations. All this has actually helped uh, in preserving the biodiversity and also improving it over the years. 
uh, I would first give some glimpses of the biodiversity that uh, uh, while we did the bench uh, baselining, we've come across. There are uh, uh, multiple species of plants. Uh, we mapped around 1,100 species of plant species. Uh, many uh, aquatic species, we have 23 uh, uh, fish species around not, uh, noted around 21 mollusk species. We have also mapped uh, the diversity of reptilian species around 31 type of species have been uh, so far observed in the premise. Uh, we have also done a very specific uh, study or program on uh, knowing the diversity of butterflies and insects in the campus. So far, we have been able to identify 82 species of butterflies, which, is, which actually maps uh, or compares to any of the wild uh, areas in the Western Ghats. So the diversity of species of butterflies, uh, which are mapped over the uh, four seasons of, of a year has, is fantastic. And there are innumerable insect species. So uh, we have also seen that uh, mapping the bird species or the avifauna is uh, very important. It actually are quite indicative of the thriving biodiversity in the campus. So far, we have been able to record 208 species of birds. And um, it is very important to know that 72 of these species are were found in the urban built environment within the campus. So uh, we've created conducive spaces within the built environment for increasing the avifaunal biodiversity as well. And in the mangroves, uh, we have so far identified six mammal species. Uh, and one of the uh, very highlighting ones in this is the golden jackal. Uh, which you can quite frequently actually uh, come across once you enter the mangroves areas in Ikrol in Mumbai. This is very, very few spaces in Mumbai which today have host these uh, golden jackals as a, a species in Mumbai. So far, we have also identified more than 70 species of spiders. I'm sure there are innumerable more and it is very difficult to actually go on spotting, but this is a relentless effort in research, uh, which is one of the fundamentals of our uh, conservation program. And this continues over the years. Now, when we talk about mangroves, there are certain indicator species that, uh, that are associated with the mangrove forest. And those also have been mapped. Uh, observing these species and looking at their sustenance uh, over the period actually indicates a healthy ecosystem that is conserved. And these are very important uh, with respect to biodiversity conservation, as well as monitoring the biodiversity within the campus. So what has been the uniqueness of uh, Godrej biodiversity management? Uh, consciously, uh, the company or the organization has maintained more natural areas than the built areas, especially in a place like Mumbai, where uh, land has a huge value. Uh, it has had, we have driven the program with participation and with collaboration for external stakeholders like researchers, NGOs, scientific communities, uh, government, the forest department, uh, etc. And uh, and over the years, our approach has also evolved uh, in terms of the governance and infrastructure building for conserving as well as increasing the um, uh, awareness about the ecosystem within the community at large. And uh, we've also seen that, in fact, this program has started even before legislations came into picture in India for conservation on an uh, ecosystem like mangroves. The company has always taken an approach of going beyond compliance uh, for the conservation efforts. Uh, in fact, uh, now the mangroves are protected by the CRZ or the uh, wetlands management rules. However, when this started in uh, 1985, there were no rules in India to protect this uh, beautiful ecosystem. A lot of emphasis has been on in situ approach for conservation research and uh, protecting the mangroves. Uh, and uh, it has also been recognized by multiple awards one of them being the Green Governance Award, uh, which was in 2005. And many dignitaries have actually visited the space uh, to look at the conservation efforts. So the journey of uh, biodiversity, conscious biodiversity management in Godrej started somewhere in 1970s, where we started developing in-house nurseries for uh, green cover development in the Piroshanagar campus of Ikroli. And it has traveled over the years. Uh, like I said, one of the important milestones was in 1985, it uh, was the formation of Sunabai Pirosha Godrej Marine Ecology Center, which was specifically formed for conservation of mangroves in Vikroli. Uh, and then there were multiple programs which were run for conservation across the city. In 1992, uh, there was a formation of Nauroji Godrej Center for Plant Research, which does research in plant diversity and conservation in the Western Ghats. And, uh, uh, 
it is very important that uh, the whole effort of biodiversity management is driven through specific programs which are comparable to any industry systems like managing the entire forest under the ISO 14000 certification as well as following various processes which are followed in the businesses uh, for managing this and um, one important uh, milestone was in 2015 when uh, we did the biodiversity indexing of the Piroshanagar campus, one of the first in India and the world for a corporate to do biodiversity index of its industrial township. And based on the indexing, uh, there are various en enhancement projects which are now undertaken. Uh, we have taken this learnings beyond the campus, beyond the fence for doing plantations across other places and uh, also experimenting with uh, different types of plantations like for example, doing the Miyawaki plantation uh, to enhance the denseness and the diversity within the campus. So uh, I spoke about the biodiversity management plan, uh, which started from the biodiversity index research, uh, which gives an overview of the biodiversity with the listing of biodiversity and the management strategy and approach to take this forward. So the strategy basically talks about three pillars. Uh, one, of course, it begins with the organizational commitment for biodiversity appropriate governance in place and putting in appropriate infrastructure. In terms of organizational commitment, uh, uh, biodiversity is included in the environmental policy of the organization. Although by statute, we don't need to have this. We are not an extractive, in, uh, uh, we are not an extractive business or an industry, but this has always been a part of our environmental policy. Uh, stringent compliance are being followed with respect to water waste management, uh, in the campus, which are actually upstream activities which demonstrate the uh, uh, responsible conservation uh, and mangroves being a downstream, in, downstream indicator of how well we are doing our upstream activities. The entire process of conservation is implemented through process frameworks at par with industry and uh, which is supported, the entire uh, biodiversity management is supported by our green procurement policies of res responsible sourcing using more of a recycled content in a pro products that we use or material we use and uh, very stringently look, looking at resource conservation. Uh, all this cannot happen uh, on its own stand, uh, standalone way. It has, it has to be a work of networking and collaboration with different stakeholders and taking into view their participation and views as well. The governance of biodiversity is run through uh, constituting various departments who support this particular initiative. Uh, it is worked through cross-functional teams, uh, including the Township Management Committee, which is part of the entire campus and uh, which is discussed at a very highest level uh, uh, through our sustainability strategy. Uh, we've always taken a beyond compliance approach in terms of uh, certifying even the conservation efforts through various initiatives. Goodridge also has been one of the pioneer members of the India Business and Biodiversity Initiative, the IBBI, which is run by CII. And uh, we've been participating in uh, uh, actually declaring our performance in biodiversity. The whole effort of the team who works on this are evaluated at par with the industry in terms of encouraging in their in terms of rewarding them uh, monetarily uh, through the processes that are deployed in the industry as well. Uh, building in, in appropriate infrastructure for biodiversity management is one of the key things for managing upstream activities which uh, need to be responsibly taken care of waste management and water management are very important. Uh, the campus is a zero waste to landfill campus where the entire waste is treated and recycled and none of it goes to dumping grounds in Mumbai, which are already overflowing. In, in terms of water management, the whole wastewater is treated and reused. Uh, it's a water positive campus. There is a huge amount of water rainwater harvesting, which is also done to maintain the water tables and avoid the ingress of sea waters. We build in-house nurseries for uh, developing plants for terrestrial as well as mangrove species for uh, plantations and conserving the biodiversity. Uh, we've built educational facilities in the campus uh, for nature trails, theme gardens, etc., which actually helps in educating people on the importance of this uh, ecosystem. And uh, most important, the, the uh, mangrove forests are protected by uh, uh, specific guards, which actually physically give protection to the area from encroachment or illegal or illicit activities. The, the three pillars on which the mangroves biodiversity management rests is on research, conservation, and awareness. Under research, we are, uh, the, uh, there are multiple programs which are taken up, uh, which are short-term, medium, or long-term programs, basically on based on biodiversity of mangroves, the ecosystem services, the uh, biodiversity and ecosystem service mapping and management, which are done through the mangroves. Uh, we have also done a study on carbon sequestration potential of the mangroves and how much is the 
carbon stock which is held in the mangroves in Bikroli. And this, all this is done through research institutes, educational institutes, NGOs, and individual experts which are engaged on various programs. It is a collaborative uh, kind of an effort uh, engaging stakeholders. And at the same time, uh, Godrej departments and employees as well as school children are also part of the research uh, programs. The conservation in the mangroves are uh, basically mm -hmm. dependent on or uh, it is supported by green cover development and maintenance, uh, the development of gardens, the theme gardens for education, community gardens. Uh, very important is control of invasive species within the campuses. We also very specifically do rescue of wildlife in distress, which actually venture into the urban spaces or the city areas uh, with the help of NGOs who are experts in this and uh, release it in the mangroves ecosystem so that they thrive. Uh, at the same time, uh, conservation of topsoil and other uh, control of wildfires are very important activities for protecting this forest uh, in, a, in the place, uh, in an urban setting. In awareness as a pillar, uh, we engage both internal and external stakeholders. With internal stakeholders, I mean the employees, the colony residents, schools, visitors uh, to the mangroves. Uh, there are multiple environmental events which are celebrated over the year to keep awareness and engagement through nature trails, photography competitions, presentations, demonstrations, exhibitions. A lot of engagement happens with the schools as well as uh, the residents of the colony to bring them, uh, bring awareness amongst them about the importance as well as how to live with the wildlife. We have also done programs on man-wildlife conflict because we do have you know, golden jackals in the campus and uh, many times they do venture into the residential spaces. But it is very important that employees are, or residents are aware about how to handle such situations without harming the wildlife. In terms of external awareness, like I said, uh, there are multiple engagements for customers, vendors, partners, to make them more aware about the initiative, uh, CBOs, NGOs, government agencies who are partners in this uh, programs. Uh, we conduct nature trails, competitions, demonstrations, posters, and around more than 200 programs are done every year with various stakeholder groups. And uh, we also do a lot of outreach through articles, radio programs. Uh, there is a Mangroves Facebook group, uh, which also uh, keeps a lot of people engaged on the happenings on the Mangroves program. Uh, you will find a lot of information on the uh, mangroves.godrej.com website on all the activities that are carried out on the mangrove conservation in Vikroli. Recently, we have also come up with the mangrove app, which is one of the first app in Asia. Uh, it has taxonomical information on 67 species of mangroves in nine regional languages, plus Hindi and English. And uh, it has reached more than 105 countries and downloaded by more than 5,000 researchers and students. We have also uh, developed uh, posters uh, on mangroves and uh, which builds in more awareness. So uh, uh, some key challenges uh, um, are conserving invasive species, documentation of biodiversity and enhancing index. So I'm concluding uh, my uh, presentation with this. I I'm happy to take any more questions on this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tejashi. That was so, um, you know, that, thank you for going into in the depth of your program. It's really nice to see all the layers. Our, um, our final speaker is Karen D'Souza, who is the director of the Shilim Institute. Karen uh, studied international business management and economics in Brussels. Her interest in sustainability began nearly a decade ago with a growing interest in food. She has shed, set up the Shilim Institute with a focus on research and project implementation in conservation, sustainability, and healing. Over to you, Karen. Thanks, Ravina, and thank you for this, um, this seminar. So the Shulam Institute is, um, is, is a non-profitable organization and it's based in the Northern Western Ghats. Um, it's, it's, a, it's over 20 years that we've been, um, you know, um, restoring and cons co conserving land in the Western Ghats. Um, and it's really a story uh, in many ways of a before and after, which some of our slides will show. Shulam, as I mentioned, is, a, a, you know, a situated in the Western Ghats. And um, as Dr. Ruth mentioned, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site and it's a biodiversity hotspot. Um, it's really started as a, um, you know, um, an initiative by uh, my father and his brother uh, over 20 years ago who wanted to um, restore land that they kept returning to and seeing, um, you know, forest fires, uh, land that was burned because of slash and burn practices. Um, and by, by uh, some of the, you know, farming community, there's a very big 
farming community in Shalem in and around the area, and also some of the local Adivasi communities, which are indigenous. Um, and because their dependence on the forest is so close, um, there's even more the, the need for survival and um, all the more need for conservation in these areas. Um, it started, um, you know, with a nursery where we had um, uh, someone who walked the property for about three to four years who lived on site and built uh, a nursery with the help of local, the local communities to understand the, you know, native plants, of course, uh, native uh, plants in different habitats across because of the, the scale of the property uh, around 3000 acres, we have various types of habitats from um, you know, dense forest to grasslands to almost savanna-ish type uh, habitats. Um, and therefore it was, it was crucial to understand what are the different types of vegetations that grow separately to create that very rich biodiversity. Uh, biodiversity. Um, we conserve today, we plant today around, um, you know, thousand to, to, we started, about 20 years planting more than 15,000 trees every year. But today the need for planting is, is less because the condition of the, of the, um, the site is actually quite, has been quite enriched. Um, and so we plant about only a thousand trees every year with seed dispersals. But I think what's crucial to our afforestation program is not the number of trees that we plant, but the quality in which and the, the in which we look at survival and thriving of plants and habitats. Of course, as everyone has mentioned in the past, watershed management is crucial to um, raising and protecting the water table in all these areas. Um, as we all know, these areas um, through the dry seasons, um, um, you know, suffer immensely from just dryness uh, from groundwater that's not being recharged from, from um, lack of soil protection and uh, lack of um, um, water protection. So of course, um, you know, after we looked, we've done several ecological studies on the site um, over the 20 years that we've been present there. And our ecological studies through um, not only on field surveying, but also uh, satellite surveying has shown that several areas that we were previously completely degraded and completely barren um, have actually now um, are not actually now um, uh, completely in, in, in the second phase of forest management, which means that it's even past the grassland phase, but and it's now really moving towards becoming core forests and part of the core forests that have already existed on the site. This is five years later. Um, you know, the, li the life, I think we've, we've gone through this and it, it, like we said, um, having the lo local people involved in safeguarding the forests um, is extremely important. We all know that. And there are various initiatives that we have created um, to give them that sort of responsibility. Um, organic farming is something that we do on a regular basis. Um, and we have, we, our method of organic farming is very much uh, agroforestry. So we look at um, you know, the forest, we look at how the, whatever we produce, whatever we produce and grow comes from, um, uh, we never use sort of GMO seeds, uh, you know, there, we, we source our seeds our, and, and collect seeds uh, very, very consciously. So some of the programs that we work with the community, of course, organic farming is, is, is one. Um, and the area, because it's a huge farming community, provides a lot of opportunity with local uh, local uh, farmers to uh, to do um, organic farming. The other program that we do is a green squads program, which is in association with ATRI, and we've been doing. We launched this program in 2019, uh, which promotes ecological awareness, especially for the local people of the local children, it's a, it's a program based, uh, uh, focused towards children. And it, um, it really uh, endeavors, I think the, 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 the goals for the program is to, are to create, um, you know, strong custodians and stewards for land conservation in the future. Um, also to give people the knowledge with very updated facts of climate change, global warming, that's being researched and um, up to date by 
top scientists in the field. And then we have very sustainability initiatives as well, like solar energy and recycling of food, um, recycling of water. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just finish. So um, to, to give you really, um, Shilam is really a great example and it's something that we've looked at over the past 20 years of it being a model for conservation across, not just in India, uh, but across uh, globally from a hospitality point of view, because we also have a retreat that, that, that hosts um, guests from, from India, but also uh, internationally. So in terms of conservation, biodiversity, um, you know, besides we've got, besides the afforestation program, we have a wonderful program that is focused around removing um, uh, exotic species of plant life on the property. And uh, that has a multifold impact on, um, um, protecting the, 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 the endemic species in the area. We have over 300 species of um, uh, trees. We have 350 species of you know, uh, birds on the site. So our list of, of, uh, of species that we've, we, we've seen in terms of the impact that it's had through the conservation efforts um, has been wonderful from the before and after of all of our ecological surveys as well on site. Uh, but I think one of the biggest things that we've realized is conservation isn't just through afforestation, but it is really um, something that is, um, it has to be all rounded in the sense that obviously we've mentioned community is a huge, huge part of the whole, uh, of all of our program um, and understanding afforestation, different habitats. I think one of the, the other things that was brought up in the, in the past was how do you look at habitats within a situ within a space, and but then look at corridors? And so you're creating, allowing wildlife to really thrive in these areas and not limiting them in, uh, in under stressful conditions, even though it might be a wonderful space for them, but really allowing them that freedom of movement um, through different habitats, which is what really leads to their um, uh, survival. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. This is um, you know, very exciting. I've had the privilege to visit Shilam on a, on a couple of occasions and it's you know, truly spectacular. So while I have you and uh, for all our speakers, I'm gonna pose two or three questions that are also some of the audience members have been sharing questions. So I'm, I'm summarizing them in some ways. And starting off with one question, all of you talked about the work that your organizations are doing, um, you know, is the imperative behind your work in conservation or all your biodiversity programs, is it, do you see it more of a, you know, like a business ethics approach or do you also see it as a business case? Now, Karen, in your case, uh, not only is there, uh, you know, a need and an imperative to protect this wonderful, um, you know, heritage, um, but also you do have a business case also, right? So uh, would you talk about the hotel, part of it and that would be very inspiring and, and important to hear yeah well for us for us it didn't start out as a business case it started out really as a conservation effort because um uh you know the family and indi it took individuals who fell in love with the land um it took individuals who fell in love with the land that they wanted to protect it so that it came from from a different place of wanting to protect this ferociously this beautiful this beautiful area um, the, the retreat that we build thereafter came as a way to sustain our conservation efforts. Um, the, the retreat uh, revenue, a percentage of revenues comes from the, ret from the retreat um, in terms of, you know, people staying at the villas, um, revenues from F&B, from all of the activities done, um, actually come directly to the Institute, which allows us to continue with our afforestation. It allows us to continue with um, everything that we're doing in the sense of, you know, educating, whether it's the local community, but also involving people from all over, you know, whether it's guests of the hotel um, with very high income levels, but also, um, you know, people from the local communities and, and different backgrounds. So I think what's beautiful about that is it really allows for that dovetailing of various kinds of people to come and interact together, but with, this, with a common uh, purpose in, in mind. Um, for us, the, this is the, the retreat therefore allows us to also have um, a larger, I would say, impact 
because of the, you know, the number of people that we have coming from all over the world who are attracted to this area because, um, you know, everything that we do is around conservation, but it's kind of flows through sustainability and healing and wellness, which is such um, a relevant um, uh, topic today. Um, yeah, this is the Shilam Hilton that you're talking about, yes. right? And so, um, I, uh, so the same question to, um, you know, the other panelists, anybody wants to take that, do you have any business case, you know, do you have some scenarios where uh, this is seen as a good thing for your business? I mean, in, in Karen's case, um, you know, the, they have, uh, you know, the, the tourism business can be very important and an important stakeholder in, in demanding in some ways um, conservation as well, right? Maybe not initially, but once you create the need for it, then come sustaining it. Yeah. Can, uh, do other people- So as I explained, sure. uh, so the business case, if you see the mining map of India and forest map of India, you will see these mining resources lies in the forest. And until and unless you are not able to conserve the biodiversity, you will not allow to work in the forest area. So you have to achieve the forest diversion, then only you will allow to do the mining. But and that's a compliance a issue. Uh, Ishmi, no, you're no, talking about a, a compliance yeah. issue, right? So this is a compliance issue, but to build the reputation that you are the responsible organization, you are doing a sustainable mining because there are thousands of organizations who are doing for the compliance, but when you build a, a reputation that you are doing something beyond the compliance, no one has asked to do the uh, water conservation at the site. They are not asking to do the plantation, but what we are doing that is beyond the compliance and building a reputation. Great, that's a great point that, uh, you know, reputation matters in a long-term, you know, sustainability for the business part of it, not just um, um, the compliance. So I think that's a really important point, point when you think of valuation, what is the valuation to the company? Um, I think that's an important uh, perspective as well. Um, of course, that we know that, that these are challenging issues also. These are not simple issues, right? That you have this wonderful resources go into it. So all of you within your companies, obviously are that there are choices that are sometimes made that you have to make that um, can prioritize certain efforts at biodiversity conservation. And sometimes there are compromises. So how do you, um, what are some of the challenges that you feel you all have faced in the specific reserves that you've talked about? You know, you've all talked about in some ways, um, sections or areas that you've been working in. What have been some of the challenges either in terms of, um, you know, dealing with the community when there's a conflict, like I can see in the, in the case of Saras, right? I mean, how do you deal with that? What are some of the internal decision-making issues that, you know, sometimes you have to prioritize, um, you know, and uh, come to a healthy compromise? And I say this uh, because it's important for people to uh, understand how do you manage conflict because, or how do you manage the challenges? Because otherwise it's, uh, um, you know, it's hard as if we are looking to encourage other businesses also to be part of it. Challenges are very much part of uh, this process as well, but they can be dealt with in a healthy manner. So one of the things we look to you to provide is a way to show us how you manage the challenges. So Rishi, do you want to speak to this? Yeah. So uh, I uh, see there, uh, there can be challenges at two level, but it's at a uh, organization level where you have to like really drive the initiative, but uh, luckily the UPL management is very, committed for the cause. So I, I've really not had that kind of an issue. Uh, the second was while implementing Cyrus project or maybe any conservation project, I think the challenge is at a community level. How do you create that ownership? How do you sell this idea to the community? Because it's, it's easy to say that you really want to build a case for community ownership, but how do you do that? And especially we are talking about uh, Cyrus. I'll talk about Cyrus, where it takes a particular patch of land in a paddy field. How do you convince a farmer to protect that? I think that's where you, you really bring in all your uh, management wisdom and all the experience that different agencies have in different places, whether it's a cultural practices and how does it uh, really benefit from a scientific perspective. You, you just marry everything together and present a case to, to the farmer group. 
and that's that's what we did uh, and we were able to successfully communicate this really helps you it's not taking anything from you it's really helping you that's how we slowly started getting buy in from the farmers that's how we were able to make this armor uh, the sarus production groups from the farmer itself so essentially it really uh, calls about the scientific evidence at, at a first stage and to communicate that in a way that it really makes a sense and a case for the local community and then driving it through all the local uh, cultural practices i think that's what we do to to overcome the the barrier and and it's a big barrier let me tell you whether you do a social forestry project a simple social forestry project or a, a very complete complex species uh, conservation project you will the first is a resistance from everyone because it's challenging the status quo so it's 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 but i think you have to like uh, slowly uh, work on it and that's the reason i said in my beginning also uh, this kind of an initiative uh, requires a lot of uh, effort on a continuous basis uh, you need a commitment from management which is long term a commitment which really is for a very very long term because you can't uh, expect an outcome in in conservation or biodiversity in one year two year three year four year uh, uh, one of panel member was talking about the mangrove plantation it has taken more than 40 years we started 79 say 80 so that's a kind of an effort it's required so management also needs to be committed for that kind of a uh, effort Tejashree, could you would you like to comment on either of these? Because you know, I mean, we've I've also ha- had the privilege of visiting the mangrove, the Godrej mangroves, which are you know in the heart of Mumbai. Like you know, and it, it's it's not easy, right? There are so many challenges in that sense. So how do you um you talked about governance internally or an internal infrastructure, you know, being very sharp on that. But nonetheless, it's got to be a drain on resources. It's got to be challenging. You know, how do you? how do companies how does your company you know um commit to that in that sense you know uh, fortunately for my uh, for me uh, the i we don't have to convince the management on this in fact you know the godish family has been very supportive of the environmental conservation efforts and it has been in their dna so the whole conservation effort of mangroves has uh, started with the family however of course it has seen a lot of challenges uh, on many multiple fronts like i said in a city like mumbai where there is a huge pressure on real estate lands you know to conserve a forest and leave it in its state uh, and taking that decision at a point of time where there were very little awareness about the importance of this kind of an ecosystem which was just termed as a marshy land which needs to be reclaimed and used uh, you know identifying it and then protecting it, it has been a, a resource a lot of resources has gone into it and efforts but um, what was important is actually you know mainstreaming the effort with the business so uh, it could still remain as a standalone effort because of the commitment of the management but uh, what what we've done is actually uh, mainstreamed it along with the business processes uh, it enjoys the same kind of benefits at the same time same kind of uh, uh, performance deliverables like any business activity which has brought in uh, uh, you know the focus on it at par with business but what it, how it has helped is uh, it a yes it de- demonstrates your brand uh, commitment to conservation uh, that goes without saying but at the same time when you look at a place like vikroli which is now a developing suburb in mumbai where uh, you know it has a huge connectivity to various spaces as, as it has been a, a usp for sell, as a selling point for real estate developers along the mangroves because you find very little green spaces in the city which actually you know uh, you have a view of such biodiverse and uh, uh, richly thriving forest so now it makes business sense basically so you to have a, a house built along, along this kind of ecosystem which is that kind of usp builders so uh, not only godrej other builders who have been building around the space have been using this as one of the usps for selling their uh, real estate flat but um, apart from that uh, uh, how it has helped is you know we have seen multiple floods in uh, in places like mumbai where and we all know the reasons for uh, that happening uh, vikroli hasn't experienced that and uh, there is a lot of awareness now about uh, in, not only in the community but also in the businesses that why the business have seen the continuity of operations despite of such natural calamities is because of the ecosystem which is you know supporting this entire uh, uh, i mean 
actually absorbing this entire onslaught and allowing the whole uh, uh, whole township to operate without hindrance despite of all the uh, uh, calamities that have befallen the city uh, so these are just two factors but uh, you know mainstreaming it is actually taking policy decisions on procurement uh, uh, it is very difficult for a company like uh, with the products like uh, we have to have a direct direct connect with the biodiversity conservation however that has been the challenge that how uh, while the senior management is convinced how do you convince the downstream you know the operational managers that this is very important in business make business decision making and uh, that has been the challenge and it slowly uh, you need to overcome that with consistent efforts in terms of building that connect and explaining why it is important for survival of the business one of the questions that's come from the audience and i think is a very pertinent question uh, this is janjri uh, jasani asking it how do you integrate biodiversity conservation into your supply chains to ensure that your procurement is not impacting habitats and ecosystems so is this csr work or is it a conservation work a separate vertical and then it doesn't or how does it influence you know the business part of the of the work you know and does it influence that at all and any examples of that that anybody any of you can share with me so uh, can i give just one example so uh, yes uh, like uh, you know uh, it at times becomes difficult to connect it with the business when you don't have a direct extractive business where you are actually going out and uh, 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 you know disturbing the biodiversity but uh, that is where the challenge with the uh, experts do come in to show that but uh, uh, you know to sustain the business or to have that social license to operate uh, we need to take this decisions one of the example one of the uh, products that goodish manufactures is the furniture and uh, uh, getting wood for the furniture wooden furnitures have its own uh, you know uh, kind of uh, a demand and getting wood for the furniture from the forest is actually destroying the biodiversity so uh, a decision to source it only from sustainable certified forests uh, the fsc certified woods is one of the important decisions which was taken so then then of course there is a cost but then it, then there is also a uh, um, license to operate that you are not destructing uh, your backyard or your forest within the Uh, which has a rich biodiversity but however sourcing it from somewhere which is meant to be uh, harvested for this production this is one example at the same time you make a choice like if you are buying a steel you buy it from companies like say tata steel or any other company who has very responsible business practices in terms of uh, not only other aspect but also biodiversity management so uh, it does have a very direct connect with the business and uh, if you look for it it makes uh, business sense to have your partners which are reputed and very responsible in their uh, business activities as well you know which ultimately impacts how how you are putting out your product into the market and uh, demonstrating how responsible you are and at the same time uh, it is uh, now i think becoming a very common practice to have certified boards used uh, for uh, use so this is just one example i can actually go on citing for many many okay, more thanks. yeah thank you that's great anybody else wants to take that yeah rishi i think ravina it's, it's it's a very valid and logical next step i'll say it's an uh, it's a kind of an evolution process uh, expecting and merging that with supply chain is a it's a long term uh, and maybe a kind of an aspirational but i think uh, it's still work in progress in lot of organization uh, we are making every effort although the, the small parts of uh, going for green purchase here and there is something that everyone is doing but i think expecting biodiversity at a supply chain is a, it's a very long term uh, aspirational goal that we all have okay um okay so i'm um, just a final uh, question before because we are already uh, over time and this is you know so interesting and it's just the beginning of a conversation because really this is a very important um, con it's it's a very important context you know we actually a lot of you are talking about reserves also that your company has been in charge of right they're not just programs in that sense but it's actually commitment of that land uh, their questions are from the audience is about what percentage of land um, you know is Uh, you know do you do you see as a potential for rewilding so i won't get into those i'll just ask you instead to um leave us you know if we have to scale this for other businesses you know one one quick last word that you would say to all of them let's start with you hishmi <coughs> so i think for scaling 
something is just if we are dividing the activities into the small activities, then these small activities should be integrated in the business plan. So what we have done, we have made our annual business plan with the biodiversity management plan. So now each individual and each business is now responsible to report the progress on the biodiversity. But once uh, the senior management is responsible to report to the board, so definitely there will be a scale, there will be a progress. So recently the Tata group is thinking to take some of the objectives after the post 2020, the zero draft is ready. So we are just working on it that which are the KPI we can take so we can scale up our biodiversity initiative, what the Tata Steel is doing, what Tata Chemical is doing good. We want to bring all the group company to have such kind of commitment. Well, thank you. Tejashree, you wanna leave us with something? Yes, I think, you know, uh, not always you need to have a large space for conserving biodiversity. I mean, you know, everybody can contribute and uh, very simple steps to do this is, how are you developing your green areas in your factories? So uh, it is mandated that you at least have 30% of your area under green cover. But uh, does that green cover mean lawns or does it mean actual trees? And uh, while you do that, what is the kind of uh, choice you're making of the biodiversity or the tree species that you're planting within your premises? That also uh, is very important. Adopting native and adapted species to thrive local biodiversity and saying a total no to invasive or exotic species, I think is a very simple way to start. So everybody can do it. Uh, you need to look at when you're developing your project, you need to look at, consciously look at uh, corridors, green corridors for migration, uh, you know, of species. These are very small things. Uh, if consciously developments are done, taking this into consideration. Uh, yes, there are large projects. There are companies who have, hold large lands who can do a lot more, who can go beyond their fence, but uh, not always you need to have that. You can start small. You can have terrace gardens, like in our campus, we have a largest one of the uh, largest terrace gardens around one and a half like square feet of terrace garden. And it does host a lot of species, uh, local biodiversity, microfauna. So, you know, every small insect uh, conserved is also a big step uh, in conserving the entire ecosystem. So uh, that's my message that everybody can do it. And uh, I think everybody should attempt to do it within the whatever space you have under your control. Thank you. Rishi, to you. I think uh, my submission would be, uh, uh, I think creating something which is, uh, which is visible and then taking forward a large scale partnership. And I think the answer is partnership, 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 whether you really want to partner with other organizations or with government. Uh, we have identified government as an important partner for us because there's a lot of things that we can do together. We are good. Uh, doing few things at a micro level, but I think government is the largest stakeholder. So we really need to partner at that level. I think that's a way forward to me. And also, I think one more thing that needs to be done is even though someone made a comment in question and answer, whether it's only a CSR report or not. But I think even if it's a small CSR initiative, we really need to make this group a little long, uh, bigger. As of now, you have just on fingers, uh, maybe 8, 10, 12, who are doing this. We really need to increase that number and build up a large scale partnership with government, non-government organization. I think that's a way forward. Super, thank you so much. Because the whole idea was what was interesting for us who work in the environmental area of, as, a, as a university, of course, but it was interesting to see these initiatives in different spaces. So to bring people on a platform, of course, we, you know, um, it's a, it's a, it's not all the groups, but definitely to bring people uh, and even connect with um, it, you know, to, to bring them to network them on a common platform. Uh, some of you, of course, know each other and have been, you know, meeting each other in different fora. But I think that uh, it's very important, even as a research university, to be an important stakeholder with the private sector. Um, and I think that's the commitment that CII and Columbia had in our partnership, you know, when we were thinking about it, how do you motivate business leaders, but how do we as a university, you know, involved in um, measuring, understanding, theorizing, um, and of course, in giving empirical evidence, how do we 
also um, you know, see ourselves as a stakeholder in, in this with the private sector and, and of course government and community. So I think uh, we've, we've learned a lot from you all. We've learned a lot from your efforts, which are fantastic. And despite all the challenges really shine and stand out as models that uh, really can, um, you know, for us, we, we are gonna look at these as cases that can be uh, inspiring to um, all those, whether big or small, starting out in this field. Thank you so much for participating. Thank you to Jane Karkada and to Swati Sargaonkar from CII Western Region for being our partners. My colleagues Aditya Petwal and Brenda Marbaniang for organizing. Thank you once again, Rishi, Hishmi and Tejashri, and of course, Karen who's left us um, for participating. And, um, and we look forward to many more conversations in this field. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. It's been thank a wonderful you, you. interactive audience. I'm sorry I couldn't get to all your questions. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.